Okay, everybody, let's get started. Um, welcome. My name is uh, Dan Canstrom, and I am joining you as the faculty director of the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy at BC Law School. Um, my day job here is as a law professor, as many of you know, um, along with the uh, Dean Vince Rougeau and our wonderful executive director, Lissy Medvedow, and our outstanding administrative assistant, Cindy Wynn. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our annual kickoff event uh, for the Rappaport Distinguished Public Policy Series. And that is a public address by our Jerome Lyle Rappaport Distinguished Visiting Professor in Law and Public Policy. The series, together with many other aspects of our programming, such as our Senior Fellows Program, aims to foster vigorous, open discussion of ideas among government, business, nonprofit, and academic thought leaders, and to help devise practical solutions to complex challenges. Our overarching themes for this year's series are diverse, but they pay close attention not only to the obvious and profound health challenges of our time, but also to an array of unusually pressing issues. We've already had programs this year on gender politics and social media, on bipartisanship, on criminal justice reform, on the travails of online education, on coping with COVID-19, and on civil rights and racial justice and state pandemic responses. Today's lecture begins a year of equally diverse and exciting programming. Please do check our website early and often. Please attend our events and please invite others uh, we aim to be not only an academic center, but a community resource by which we mean to include a very wide community. So let me now briefly introduce our speaker and distinguished visiting professor, Richard Cordray. Richard Cordray has had a wide ranging and most impressive career of public service. He's probably best known nationally as the first director of the newly created Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB from 2012 to 2017. Prior to that pathbreaking role, he served as Ohio's Attorney General, Solicitor General, and Treasurer. He was the Democratic nominee for Governor of Ohio in 2018. He attended Michigan State University, after which he was a Marshall Scholar at Oxford. He attended the University of Chicago Law School, where he was Editor-in-Chief of the Law Review. He clerked for Judge Robert Bork on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and for Justice Anthony Kennedy at the Supreme Court of the United States. Perhaps most impressively in the midst of all this in 1987, he became an undefeated five-time Jeopardy champion. He was elected to the Ohio House of Representatives in 1990. He was then appointed by the Ohio Attorney General as the first Solicitor General of Ohio, which led to six appearances before the U.S. Supreme Court. And following Republican victories in statewide elections, he entered private practice, but he was then elected Ohio State Treasurer in 2006. He became Attorney General in 2008, but lost his bid for re-election to former U.S. Senator Mike DeWine and became the director of the CFPB via recess appointment and was confirmed by the Senate in 2013. There's much more I could say about his deeply engaged and most impressive career, but I, I wanna leave the maximum amount of time for him to address us. Um, I wanna tell everybody this is being recorded. So if you don't consent to being re recorded, please um, take whatever actions you feel appropriate. But under Massachusetts law, we have to give you fair warning. This is being recorded, well, although we're not recording you in particular, but still you're participating. Second, people who have questions should use the Q&A function on Zoom. I will be reading those questions. And after Rich Cordray finishes his remarks, um, we will go through those questions uh, up until about 1.15 with as much time as we can muster. And if it's a really pressing question, we don't have time to get to it, you can email Lissy Medvedow or Cindy Wynn or me, uh, um, and we can uh, um, facilitate ways to answer those questions after the talk. Okay, so the topic for today is timely, engaging, and extremely important. It is entitled Comparing the Economic Effects of the COVID Crisis of 2020 with the Financial Crisis of 2008. Um, so please join me in heartily welcoming Rich Cordray to Boston College and to the Rappaport Center. I'm going to applaud him now and I would urge you all to do the same. Now we will unmute our speaker. Okay, thank you, Dan. 
uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Of course, during the pandemic, the word here always requires interpretation. As things now stand, I've been unable to deliver this community address in person, but I'm very much with you in spirit. To demonstrate, I refer to the law school's mission statement, which declares that this enterprise is, quote, rooted in the Jesuit tradition of service to God and others, recognizing our central commitment to social and economic justice, and striving to advance this commitment in the extracurricular projects that the law school supports. Today's community address is one of those projects, so putting aside the vagaries of virtual versus actual presence, I will focus on a topic that's fully consonant with our mission statement, the nature and effects of economic collapse, and how our society can best address it. Twelve years ago, the United States suffered the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Some few older Americans, like my father, lived through those earlier dark times and saw what they meant for families and communities. He lost his modest savings in the failure of the local bank, one of thousands of such failures around the country, in an era when personal savings were not backed by any government guarantees. So many people's lives were upended, and I later heard the famous American hero John Glenn recount how scared he was as a child when, at the top of the stairs, he overheard his parents below discussing the very real prospect that they would lose their home to foreclosure, a calamity that befell huge numbers of people during the Depression. In the fall of 2008, the financial crisis marked by the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, among others, clobbered this country. The credit markets froze, which inevitably led to a contraction of national output and a corresponding spike in job losses. In January 2010, unemployment peaked at 10.6%, and it took five long years to fall back to 5.7%, which has been the average rate since World War II. During my tenure as the first director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, I regularly described the Great Recession as the worst economic collapse of our lifetime, and believed that would be so for another generation or two at least. After all, it had been 75 years since the Great Depression, and cataclysms are rare. But now here we are, unexpectedly, with the economy cratering again only 12 years later. We face a distinctly different situation now than we did in 2008, but the differences invite comparison and analysis. In both instances, I'll focus on three points, the causes, the effects, and the nature of the responses, including both short-term responses and more lasting reforms. In general, economic dislocations can have a variety of potential causes. External shocks, such as the energy crisis of the 1970s, or internal problems, such as runaway inflation in the early 1980s, or the dot-com bubble of 2001. This variety of causes produce dissimilar effects, peculiar to the nature of the specific cause. But they also produce similar effects that attend any major downturn, such as mass unemployment, investments in the economy itself. Regardless, they demand suitable responses, both as a matter of treating the current symptoms and preventing future recurrences. And it's fair to say they generally result in political consequences as well. To begin with then, what were the causes of the Great Recession? At the outset, I was serving an elective office in Ohio, first as the state treasurer and then as the attorney general. When the financial crisis hit in 2008, my job was to safeguard the public's money by maintaining our liquidity and avoiding losses, which thankfully we were able to do. For the next two years, my job was as Attorney General to secure justice for Ohioans who were wronged by Wall Street abuses. And I embraced that role enthusiastically, pursuing lawsuits on behalf of Ohio taxpayers and pensioners against AIG, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Bank of America, and others. We ultimately recovered over $2 billion for Ohioans, but the work we did was partial at best, and all of it was retrospective, meaning the harm had already been done, and we simply tried to clean it all up as best we could. From my bird's eye view of the proceedings, I saw that the economy had developed two major problems. The first was extremely irregular activity in the mortgage market. This problem first surfaced in the Midwest, in Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana which was early to the foreclosure crisis and gave it the appearance of a localized Rust Belt phenomenon. By 2004, we began to see elevated levels of foreclosure filings and property tax delinquencies, which were perplexing as the economy remained strong and was not yet in recession. 
The explanation turned out to be a combination of deteriorating underwriting standards and outright predatory loans. Many of them high cost second lien mortgages targeted to homeowners with no prior payment difficulty. that were causing pockets of foreclosures in certain neighborhoods. National policymakers failed to recognize the problem until it expanded a few years later into the so-called sand states of California, Nevada, and Arizona, as well as Florida. Even then, very few people believed that any consumer-based market, even one as large as the mortgage market, could destabilize badly enough to threaten the broader economy. Existing data sources were not robust enough to capture the true scale of the problem as it began to spread. Profound externalities that emanated from these events created further harm to consumers, many of whom were minding their own business and were not themselves involved in any of the bad lending. The second problem was transmission of these malignancies into the credit markets through securitization. This financial mechanism originated with the government-sponsored enterprises, especially the two giants, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They intermediate 30-year fixed-rate mortgages into available investment instruments, which, without prepayment penalties, have become a popular and almost uniquely American means of supporting and encouraging home ownership. But as the market for private label securitization began to blossom, it became possible to transform tangible problems of real economic activity into new problems for financing investments and ongoing business operations. To begin with, the apparently insatiable appetite of financial for mortgages to securitize in lucrative deals spawned exotic mortgage products. These included growing numbers of adjustable rate mortgages aimed at the subprime market, interest-only loans, and negatively amortizing loans on which the borrower could owe more and more over time. Diminished underwriting standards were either ignored or overlooked in the rush to fill the demand for such products, all premised on the unlikely notion that home values would always appreciate or at least remain constant over time. In retrospect, as conditions degraded in the mortgage market, it seems remarkable that home values held up as well as they did for as long as they did. But increasing numbers of defaults eventually led home values to crater in many communities, ruining families and ultimately leading to seismic reverberations on Wall Street, the collapse of the far-flung insurance and financial firm AIG, the bankruptcy of the storied investment banking firm Lehman Brothers, and the failure or absorption of large mortgage lenders such as Washington Mutual, Countrywide, and AmeriQuest. The mortgage market meltdown, as a precipitating cause of the crisis, was unexpected in many ways. The increasing looseness of mortgage lending was apparent to many observers, but it was largely condoned as a byproduct of public policy favoring greater home ownership. This, in turn, was an element of broader theories aimed at fostering an ownership society that would build resilience in a wider middle class. This policy coincided with lax financial regulation to allow a giant speculative bubble to take form in the mortgage industry. But the bubble finally popped, and that brought on an economic crisis of epic proportions. Millions of people lost their jobs, millions lost their homes, and virtually everyone lost trillions of dollars in household wealth and retirement savings. Based on this account of its causes, the Great Recession was marked by two major weaknesses in the U.S. First, the housing market, itself a source of considerable economic activity, was deeply damaged. That had dire consequences for lenders, brokers, realtors, and all the many related parties in the real estate market, as well as the related industry for home improvements. As 4 million Americans lost their homes, the further effects on wealth accumulation were profound. In communities of color, where people had more of their assets tied up in their home values, the destruction of wealth was dramatic. And as former homeowners were effectively locked out of the housing market because the foreclosure blights a consumer's credit report for seven years, their chances of recovering their losses were negligible, unlike others whose investment losses in stocks and bonds were more likely to be made up over time. Second, financial channels were impaired, the credit markets locked up, and many businesses lost financing that were unprepared for such a setback. Any financial crisis has an especially broad impact because it flows into unrelated sectors of the economy. In the auto industry, Chrysler and General Motors were forced into bankruptcy and got financial help from the federal government. About 2 million small businesses went bust as commercial lending dried up. The banks themselves were on the brink as many smaller ones fell into receivership 
and some larger ones were saved only by substantial infusions of capital from the federal government. Heavy layoffs throughout the economy slowed consumer demand as median household income declined. The principal sources of weakness, mortgage lending and housing, and the financial industry were also highly problematic because their tangled affairs did not allow any quick return to equilibrium. Unlike in the blackboard models of economists, where the supply and demand graphs are self-correcting, these sectors were hindered by a mass of litigation that had to be resolved to clarify affairs and settle accounts. In the mortgage and housing markets, 4 million foreclosures created backlogs that clogged the legal pipelines and took years to resolve. In the financial industry, as Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, famously prophesied in 2011, quote, and everybody is going to sue everybody else, and it's going to go on for a long time, which it did. These dislocations in the economy thus were substantial and prolonged. One feature of this period was the Federal Reserve's decision to lower interest rates to effectively zero, a drastic policy that was sustained for seven years to combat the longest downturn since World War II. Rate of financing measures from Treasury and the Fed bailed out or shored up ailing companies. The Congress passed a fiscal stimulus that seemed large by historical standards at almost a trillion dollars, yet ran into concerns about the budget deficit that took precedence over whether the response was adequately sized for the scale of the problem. In addition, many of the funds went to longer term projects whose effects were not felt right away in the everyday economy, but only further down the road. Somewhat surprisingly, these efforts to stimulate the economy did not spark inflation, apparently because they were implemented against the backdrop of a worldwide savings glut, and perhaps for reasons relating to worse age inequality. As for the foreclosure problem, the government's response was anemic. Programs for drowning homeowners were set out haltingly in small volumes and with complex processes the result was a slow and gradual recovery that took years to gain back the ground that was lost. Many homeowners whose mortgages were underwater, meaning they owed more than the house was worth, were stuck in place, the lack of mobility impairing the labor market. Unemployment declined only sluggishly from its peak, held back also by the piggybacking fiscal problems of state and local governments, which cut more than a half million jobs in the four years The disjunction between perceptions of how much more was done for Wall Street than for Main Street also had political effects that affected the direction of longer term reform. Because the Great Recession could be traced to weaknesses in the mortgage market and financial investment channels, Congress inevitably stepped in to consider what steps should be taken to prevent more such events in the future. Bipartisan efforts gave way to partisan squabbles focused on the extensive scope of the new reforms. Nonetheless, the Dodd-Frank Act squeaked through the passage. It contained tough measures that reform mortgage origination and servicing, which have greatly improved the underpinnings of this market. It also compelled even vaster changes to limit risk and strengthen the stability of the financial system. The latter measures provided new liquidation authorities for financial firms, limits on how banks can make investments along with enhanced capital requirements, regulation of derivatives and swap transactions, monitoring of credit rating agencies, oh, and the creation of the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The sheer size of the legislation. Stop you there. One second. We're having a little trouble with the Zoom. Um, I, is there any way you can turn up the volume or um, aim as directly at the microphone as possible? We're just going in and out a tiny bit. Sorry to interrupt, but maybe we could fix it that way. My volume's uh, at its peak, so I don't think I can change that. But uh, shall I just continue? Yes, please. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Okay. The sheer size of the legislation, together with the accompanying thousands of pages of expected regulation, stoked a political debate over the wisdom and efficacy of market interventions. Coupled with resentments over the response to the crisis, these measures fueled the Tea Party movement uh, in 2010 uh, that advocated smaller government, lower budget deficits, and less regulation. This platform put its resounding imprint on the midterm elections that year that brought about the largest shift in seats in the House of Representatives in over a half century. The result was gridlock in the Congress and heightened polarization around issues of financial regulation and control that in many ways limited the further impact and development of the legislative reform framework. 
hogging the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's work, even prior to the deregulatory thrust of the Trump administration. So much for the economic collapse of 2008 and the ensuing period that we now know as the Great Recession. As I noted before, at the time, it seemed to be the worst setback we were likely to experience for the next several decades. Yet in speed and severity, the unanticipated economic decline we've experienced in 2020, at least in its earliest stages, has far outstripped it. During the second quarter of this year, U.S. GDP plunged by an annualized rate of 32%, on top of a decline of 5% during the first quarter, almost all of which was felt in the nationwide suspension of economic activity in the last two weeks of the first quarter. This decline was much sharper than the worst quarter of the prior recession, when GDP fell by 7.2% in the fourth quarter of 2008. But of course, the causes of the economic setback this year are entirely different from the causes of the prior downturn. Whereas the 2008 problems flowed from two major sources of weakness in the U.S. economy, there were no obvious deficiencies in our economy as of February 2020. The preceding September, unemployment had reached levels not seen for the past 50 years, 3.5%. It had held steady since. These were the fruits of the longest peacetime recovery in our history, the same sluggish recovery we described earlier, which eventually helped us emerge from the Great Recession. And though that recovery was now long in the tooth, it betrayed no symptoms that forecast. The Federal Reserve's Beige Book of Economic Conditions, released in February, noted that economic activity expanded at a modest to moderate rate over the past several And the outlooks for the near term were mostly for modest growth with the coronavirus and the upcoming presidential election cited as potential risks. Notably, neither of those risks was itself economic in nature or endemic to any sector of the economy. So with the economy seemingly sound, the cause of the 2020 collapse was instead the effect of a policy determination reached in March at the federal, state, and local levels. The decision made by many officials was largely to shut down in-person circulation and most corresponding face-to-face -face economic activity with the aim of containing and controlling the pandemic threat posed by COVID-19. The situation was unparalleled, much like a medically induced coma to treat a patient confronting urgent life-threatening circumstances. A large-scale cessation of most interpersonal activity was certain to produce an economic collapse, and it did almost immediately. The obvious questions thus raised were how the coma would affect the patient and how the patient would once the coma ended. With no particular distortions causing the collapse, the general effects were those to be expected from any economic downturn, a decline in output, a spike in unemployment, and a reduction in the credit available to finance business activity, especially for small businesses. In such an unusual situation, the data were not easily subject to interpretation in part because the numbers affected became so large that they overwhelmed established methods of data collection, including state unemployment application processes and the normal utilization of seasonal adjustments. But as best we can tell, unemployment more than quadrupled from 3.5% in February to 14.7% in April, before receding thus far to 8.4% in August. The further progress of this key number is very much in question at this point. Temporary layoffs from the outset of the pandemic now fully restored. Are business closures still occurring at elevated rates? Will state and local government revenue shortfalls lead to more jobs being cut? Will consumer spending hold up? Will there be a wave of foreclosures and evictions at some point? And if so, when? Is there other noise in the data that needs to be rationalized, such as the effect of census hiring on the employment numbers? The answers to many of these questions are not yet clear. So at least we can be sure that we have millions more people unemployed today than we did six months ago. To illustrate the numbers briefly, last week, the four-week moving average of new unemployment claims was 912,000. The comparable number from February, when the economy was still healthy, was 210,000. By the same measure, four-week moving average, continuing unemployment claims last week stood at 13.5 million, the corresponding number from February was 1.73 million. What are the effects on the world's largest economy when it is halted instantaneously as though shutting off a light switch? Can it be switched back on all at once just by lifting the government edicts? 
These issues gave rise to the current debate over whether we will see a V-shaped recovery, a U-shaped recovery, or perhaps a W-shaped recovery if the economy bounces back more sporadically. To assess these alternatives, it's useful to distinguish among three points. The public health response to the pandemic itself, the behavioral resp responses of American consumers to the new paradigm, and the decisions made by employers in both the public and private sectors. First, as to the pandemic. We may never know what the economy would have done had it simply switched off and then on over a brief period of, say, two to three months, with enormous assistance provided to bridge the temporary gap in activity. Given that the project of bringing the pandemic under control, at least in this country, has proven to be quite challenging, we are not returning to full illumination immediately. Our situation instead is more like flipping the light switch with a newly applied dimmer control. If the economy cannot reopen fully or can do so only over a longer period, then the downturn will be worse and the recovery more prolonged. So the trajectory of that crucial variable, the effects of the pandemic, remains to be worked out. And it is the single most important question mark for the time being. Second, as to the responses of consumers, every major economic shift leads to potential behavioral change among the public. There are many indicators, for example, that the negative experience of the Great Depression led to lasting modifications of consumer behavior, such as reduced willingness to access credit, higher savings rates, and greater risk aversion. The Great Recession, similarly, seemed to hasten certain societal trends, such as later household formation, reduced labor mobility, and decreased risk taking. It's a fair question today whether, even with the threat of the virus removed by an effective vaccine and a withering of caseloads, Consumer behavior will return to prior channels or will be marked instead by more lasting changes. In the interim, we can certainly see that actions to rescind or modify the more drastic lockdown orders have not led most people to react as though nothing had ever happened. Many remain cautious and have altered the patterns of their lives accordingly. Third, as to decisions made by employers in both the public and private I've already mentioned the prospect of reduced government employment at both the state and local level due to budget shortfalls. That is a given, with the only question being how much negative effect it will have in different parts of the country. Private employers are a more interesting case because of differential impacts in various sectors of the economy based on numerous factors worth exploring more carefully. With any economic reverse, there comes a shakeout of weaker businesses. The cycles of capitalism are unforgiving, whether because of financing difficulties, lack of consumer demand, or changes in cost structures or supply chains, the bottom of the cycle always winnows certain companies that are unable to survive amid harsher conditions. The brunt often falls on smaller firms whose margins are thinner and their financial lifelines more tenuous. That is happening again right now, yet it is affected also by the nature of the causes of the current crisis. Even though this crisis is not caused by any special economic weakness, it is having differential effects on various industry sectors. The businesses that operate most effectively face-to-face -face with customers, the damage is more severe. In all forms of hospitality, for instance, tourism, hotels, bars and restaurants, airlines, cruise ships, and the like, the shakeout has been more pronounced. In retail, depending on whether a business is reliant on in-store sales, again, the fallout goes deeper. One effect of the downturn, therefore, is an intersector shift among businesses that can maintain demand through alternative means, such as grocery stores, and those that find it harder to do so, such as bars and restaurants. The effects of the pandemic are also accelerating changes that were already occurring in the economy. Most notably, this is true of the adoption and expansion of technologies that allow some activities to occur at a distance. The new normal, such as we're exemplifying right now in the mode of this address, where we previously relied on in-person exchanges despite all the time, cost, and inconveniences of travel that attended the old normal. In fields like legal practice, trade conferences, recurring meetings, or social or business gatherings of all kinds, our habits and expectations are shifting. It is now an interesting question how much of this shift will become permanent or how far these changes will be unwound eventually. As with other changes in the components of consumer demand, these adjustments will bolster some companies at the expense of others, or some parts of their businesses over other parts. 
We are seeing companies that are thriving in this environment, their profits at new highs and their stock prices soaring. Others are rapidly overhauling their approach by hurrying changes that likely would have occurred eventually, but would have progressed much more slowly had the pandemic never occurred. It is also worth noting that these changes, if true, could have positive effects on the market. What about the areas of the economy, the mortgage and housing markets, the banks and the Wall Street investment fared so poorly during the Great Recession. How are they faring now? It may be surprising to find that the mortgage and housing markets have performed well through this downturn so far. Mortgage originations are at record levels and home values rose over the summer. The reforms put in place to address bad lending practices led to sounder mortgages and homeowners have built up large reserves of equity in their homes. Part of the story here has also been the government's response, which we will turn to in a moment. The banks, having built up substantial capital reserves as required by new government regulations, have been on firm footing through the crisis thus far, though their exposure to commercial property loans is growing and could end up yielding substantial losses for the biggest. Since Wall Street is not grappling with the deluge of defaulting investments, it has been able to navigate the stock market swings successfully, booking large trading gains as values fully recovered from the plunge of more than 30% earlier in the year though many believe that current stock valuations are inexplicably divorced from real economic conditions. Again, the government's response is a large part of the story here as well. The market's trough occurred on March 23rd, the day when Fed Chair Jerome Powell announced drastic interventions to up financial markets. Many investors are convinced that despite the economy's weaknesses, they can count on monetary and fiscal stimulus to protect their aggressive position. In fact, the government's response has been the key driver shaping the 2020, which is only fair since it was government action that originally set Again, leaving aside the pandemic itself and how it has been handled, or rather mishandled, which remains a crucial variable whose further fluctuations are not yet clear. It is interesting to compare how the government has responded to the economic side of the current crisis in contrast to its response to the financial crisis of 2008. At the outset, the Federal Reserve again opened the spigots and made its intention clear to backstop the economy by all available means. This was true in 2008 as well, though then it also meant shoring up the banks with capital infusions, consolidating weaker players with stronger players, which is not the necessary response. Interest rates have been reduced to zero again, and forward guidance is projecting that they will remain flat until at least 2023 which is not the outside limit as the seven year stretch of zero rates during the Great Recession has recently established. The Fed has a sensible aversion to moving into negative interest rate territory, though in real rather than nominal terms, that in fact is the present status. The Fed has also been willing to make purchases of corporate bonds and to bail out the airline industry, harking back to the auto rescue the last time. But having the Federal Reserve be willing to flood the economy with money is something occurred during each of the two crises. The bigger difference this time is the scope of the fiscal response from the Congress, which reflects lessons learned from the previous crisis. The CARES Act, which took effect on March 27th, is a $2.2 trillion stimulus bill, more than doubling the size of the Recovery Act of 2009. And further legislation has raised the total outlay to $2.9 trillion in Congress plus some further uncertain amounts committed by executive orders. The CARES Act authorized the Fed to purchase up to $250 billion in corporate bonds, as well as to make grants to bail out the passenger airlines. In addition, however, it did two things to make certain that this time government health got to Main Street more quickly. First, Congress authorized direct one-time stimulus checks as it did in 2009 but this was supplemented by the ongoing subsidies of enhanced unemployment benefits for at least four months, including both $600 per week in added benefits and new benefits for the self-employed and others who do not normally qualify for unemployment. Not everyone was helped by these measures immediately. Some state systems were overwhelmed by the volume of applicants or had trouble transitioning their outdated computer systems and other workers remained employed but saw their hours slashed and so did not qualify for benefits. But overall, the result was an approximation of the academic concept of blanketing a wide swath of the population with so-called helicopter money, so termed because it reflects a willingness to shower money instantly and largely indiscriminately 
in response to an urgent economic crisis. Second, Congress authorized the Paycheck Protection Program, providing direct help to small businesses that agree to maintain payroll and hire back employees who were laid off. We are learning about abuses, including some large companies with access to other sources of that applied for and secured some of these loans, which are forgivable on easy terms. But a large amount, about 80% of the $659 billion allotted for this program was dispersed in an incredibly short time. Critics have argued that European wage subsidies would better protect workers in such places, and that may be so. But there's no question that these measures have provided more support for U.S. households than the provisions of the Recovery Act 11 years ago. In addition, the CARES Act included safety valves against another housing crisis by requiring mortgage forbearance on all government-backed mortgages, covering about two-thirds of the market, and a moratorium on evictions for tenants whose landlords have a government-backed mortgage less effective because it covers a much smaller fraction of the residential So the moratorium has now been extended and expanded by executive order. The contours of this response reflect lessons learned from the last crisis. First, the relief made available by the CARES Act is distributed far more generally than the financial relief typically available from the Federal Reserve. Both the enhanced unemployment benefits and the PPP loans flow directly to local communities with little or no role for Wall Street and no need to take the time to prepare shovel ready checks. Second, this relief happened quickly with few or no strings attached and no complex processes to navigate other than the flaws that were exposed in many state unemployment processes. More fraud will result, but that's the trade-off for getting money quickly into the hands of families. Third, the protections extended to many homeowners and renters supplemented by foreclosure and eviction moratoria either imposed or negotiated at the state and local level in many areas, were directed at forestalling another crisis in the mortgage and housing. They also recognized that in a pandemic marked by stay-at-home orders, it must be a last resort for people to be ousted. The effect of this response has been in part to mask the severity of the crisis. In April, Jamie Dimon again, reasonably predicted that, quote, a bad recession was on the way. But by July, he was noting something different because of the swift and potent government response. He said, this is not a normal recession. The consumer's incomes are up, savings are up, and home prices up. The recessionary part of this you're going to see down the road. Indeed, total household income in July, strangely, was higher than it had been in February, even with elevated unemployment. That meant consumer demand was holding up much better than expected, even though saving rates rose as consumers cut back on Christmas expenditures because of the shifting patterns of life in the dead pandemic. In part because of this reality, and in part because of forbearance offerings, defaults remained low on mortgage loans and auto loans. And payments on federal student loans were deferred first through September under the CARES Act and then through December by executive order. One way to view the upshot of the government's response is to borrow a concept from the public health measures adopted around the country. Just as officials sought to flatten the curve of the coronavirus to reduce strain on the capacity of hospitals and medical providers, the economic response has managed to flatten the curve of the current recession to minimize the damage to businesses and households over the short term until the path ahead becomes clearer. Right now, some leaders in Congress are apparently in such a diagnostic mode as they hesitate over whether to incur more deficit spending to provide more relief now that the rate of unemployment has fallen back into the single digits and the extra unemployment benefits and PPP funds Without the boost in household incomes that these measures had provided, and with protections against and evictions beginning to expire, the true underlying conditions are hard to assess and may look quite different by the end of the year. Although the picture remains hazy and incomplete based on the data we can see at this point, it does seem that the economy needs more persistent fiscal aid to speed an eventual recovery beyond the plateau we may be resting on right now, which can be accurately described as a U-shaped recovery. The current plateau is still marked by high levels of unemployment, and without more assistance, a high jobless rate will begin to be felt more directly in the real economy by a downward pressure on household incomes. Nationwide, 3.5 million homeowners remain in mortgage forbearance, and even though that number has been gradually improving, 1.7 million of those plans are now set to expire in September. Coupled with the definite prospect of the coming austerity for state and local governments, 
more federal support seems warranted. The argument about deficits is not a minor one, given how dramatically the federal debt has ballooned in the last year, first because of tax cuts, now because of the pandemic. Yet the specter of inflation remains mostly hypothetical, likely in reasons that obtained a decade ago. As long as that remains true, and it is not a given, and thus always bears close scrutiny, then it's possible to finance deficits at extremely low interest costs. And efforts to stimulate stronger growth in the economy will be worth the risk. Before we close, we need to consider some of the actual and potential political effects of the current economic crisis. Certainly, in the run-up to this election, we are feeling immense political pressures on several fronts, as it promises to be unusually consequential. We can begin by asking what political factors led to the government's response to this downturn to differ from the last I see three primary differences. First, we've adapted to lessons learned from the smaller, slower, and more holding response to the 2008 financial crisis especially by ensuring a wider and faster distribution of aid to the general population. Second, in an era of divided government, all the political forces had to unite to support a more massive fiscal stimulus. In 2009, even though Democrats controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency, the Senate filibuster meant that Republicans could, could exercise a veto over an upper bound to fiscal stimulus, which they set somewhat arbitrarily at $1 trillion, though they were not alone in their unease about the budget deficit. For various reasons, no doubt including political considerations, that discomfort has been largely set aside this year. The 2020 deficit currently exceeds $3 trillion and could even grow closer to $4 trillion. Third, part of the explanation for the new political alignment in response to this economic crisis almost surely has been the odd circumstances of the pandemic. Nobody can pass and blame on any portion of the general public for the economic collapse, which is imposed by government fiat not the irresponsible or greedy actions of those in any specific Turning to the political consequences of this recession, it's too soon to make any reliable predictions. Inevitably, the downturn will negatively affect those seeking to enter the workforce and those being pushed out of the workforce. The extent of the scarring depends on how the economy manages to progress through the adverse conditions that will generate over the next year or two. This will also depend in turn on further decisions that must be made to shape the ongoing government response both the health crisis and the economic crisis. But certain effects are already clear. First, the transition of our society to online commerce and activity is being greatly accelerated. That means an altered pattern of winners and losers with ramifications for specific economic sectors and a continued overhaul of the way many businesses. Second, the situation is exposing new fault lines in our country. Just as the financial crisis of 2008 spawned a deep resentment and alienation for many who felt left out and left behind. The contrast between those who can work remotely and those who cannot has been starkly highlighted. Those who can do their work about as well online as they can in person have been largely unaffected or have even thrived economically. But many others who have to bear new safety risks to go to work or are being deprived of the chance to work at all or as much as they need to preserve their finances have been or will be hurt. The digital divide has existed for some time has become a yawning cavity during this pandemic for work, for schooling, and for life in general. The downturn also is aggravating the already high levels of inequality in our society, disproportionately harming communities of color with perilous repercussions. The suggestion that we are seeing a K-shaped recovery as the rich get richer and the poor grow poorer, unfortunately seems to square with the economic facts we're seeing thus far. Lastly, it is also too soon to determine what long-term reforms are warranted in response to these events. No doubt we need better measures to help us anticipate, prevent, and deal with current and future pandemics. On the economic front, we need to evaluate and address the effects of the huge fiscal and monetary stimulus we put in the economic crisis, and to consider how to refine our options to respond most effectively to future crises. Since the current crisis, unlike the financial crisis, was not brought on by specific short it is not evident that major financial reforms will be justified in its wake. At a minimum, however, the thinking that has been done since 2008 about the overall stability of the financial system deserves reassessment as new sources of fragility have been exposed. Certainly, the validating effects of mortgage market reforms over the past decade show us that when we undertake difficult economic reforms, we can succeed. And a steadfast attention to the plight of the consumer 
as well as the needs of employers is warranted as a properly focused response to the troubles we can see. Thank you again, and I would be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Richard, for that uh, most detailed and informative and frankly, in many respects, quite chilling <laughs> assessment of where we are. Um, I have many questions, but I'm going to defer because I may have other opportunities. We have two written questions, which I will um, read and uh, we'll just take them one at a time. I think we have time to just go through them in some detail. And they're both, at least the first two questions are quite um, specific and um, substantive. Uh, and I, I do want to apologize to people for the Zoom transmission. I was able to hear virtually everything. It's just, I, Rich, I don't know if you could tell, but it was sort of waving in and out a little bit as you were talking, but we did get it through. So I hope others could hear well enough. I think I think they, they can. Um, and hope, hopefully people can hear me and can hear the answers. So our first question was is from Gary Klein, who has represented consumers in litigation over many years and describes himself as someone who has little faith in the capacity of the loan servicing industry to manage delinquent accounts, including to administer legally mandated relief options for consumers who lack legal financial resources. Do you have any opinions to share on whether servicers now will have the staff and the systems to avoid the chaos that's likely to come when consumers are required to put repayment plans in place, a lot of that deferred debt, and the chaos of the type that he describes as having undermined the HAMP program during the mortgage crisis. And a second part of the question is, will any part of Dodd-Frank help to mitigate the past failure of the loan servicing industry to manage delinquent debt and to avoid uh, unnecessary downstream foreclosures, repossessions, and collections actions? Um, yeah, so to start with, mortgage servicers, and I talk about this in my book, uh, Watchdog, which is about the CFPB and consumer finance in America, uh, performed incredibly poorly during the financial crisis of 2008 and the Great Recession. They could not handle large volumes of problematic uh, mortgages. Uh, they, they mishandled foreclosures. Uh, they gave rise to the robo-signing scandal, uh, which ended up with billions of dollars in compensation and penalties uh, because of the way they mistreated consumers. One of the big jobs we had at the Consumer Bureau was to try to clean up that industry and get it back on a constructive track, uh, which we did in part by adopting new mortgage servicing rules. And based as they are under the Truth in Lending Act and the Real Estate Settlement Practices Act, uh, they do give rise to a certain amount of, of product liability, uh, which has helped discipline the industry. And we had many enforcement actions against the servicing industry and engaged in supervision of the industry to make sure that they performed somewhat better. Nonetheless, I was constantly frustrated uh, at the slowness with which they instituted reforms and the somewhat haphazard uh, nature of their uh, processes. Uh, in this current crisis, their performance has been eased and masked a bit because all of this stimulus that's gone to households and the forbearance provisions in the CARES Act have made it uh, easier and they have, have mitigated uh, the crush of foreclosures that otherwise uh, might have uh, ensued. Uh, but what that means is that we haven't yet seen for sure how they're gonna perform when push comes to shove, which is the second part of the question that was asked. I do think that uh, the, the measures put in place by the Consumer Bureau will make things better, but that depends in part on the Consumer Bureau's willingness and vigor to enforce those rules and to engage in meaningful oversight of these companies. Uh, two colleagues and I, Diane Thompson and Chris Peterson, published a white paper on the platform Medium earlier this fall in which we called out the Consumer Bureau that it could not regard this uh, downturn as simply an occasion to go easy on businesses because consumer facing businesses, if you go easy on them, will dump the brunt onto consumers themselves. And so mortgage servicers in particular need to be scrutinized carefully and intensively to make sure they're doing the right things, that they're actually delivering some of the relief that is intended uh, in the law. But the process has been very simple this time. You only really need to provide an affidavit uh, saying that you've been affected by the crisis to get the relief that's intended. 
So the excuses that they used of the complexity of paperwork in the prior uh, crisis no longer uh, hold. So I am hopeful that we will have better results in that industry than we did before, in part because of reforms that have improved the industry and in part because of lessons learned that make the processes easier this time. But the jury is out and it remains to be seen because they haven't really been pressed hard yet until we actually start to see household income dropping as it will uh, without more stimulus here. Uh, and then uh, the uh, rubber will meet the road, so to speak. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Professor Patricia McCoy, um, who begins by noting that foreclosure and eviction moratoria are designed for temporary falloffs, temporary falloffs of income. However, if more businesses fail, she fears that increased job losses will occur and become permanent. For those jobless borrowers and renters who are now in more permanent distress, will the rationale for moratoria fall away and then we may face mass evictions and foreclosures? It's a good question. It's a, it's a hard question and it's one that it's difficult to predict the answer because it has to do with future choices that people are going to make uh, in different ways. Uh, first of all, some number of moratoria will no doubt be extended. Uh, in part because we continue to have the underlying problems of the pandemic itself. If we had flattened the curve and left it low uh, and squashed the virus in this country, then the arguments for taking off the moratoria would bear more weight. Given that the pandemic still is out there, it still is killing uh, seven to 800 uh, Americans every day. Uh, Caseloads are still rising by 35 to 40 to 45,000 per day. Uh, I think the arguments for extending the moratoria uh, continue to have a lot of weight in different parts of the country. Uh, now, having said that, the moratoria, as Pat points out, is a temporary measure. Uh, it only says that you cannot file or proceed, or depending on the nature of the wording of, of the precise measure, uh, with foreclosure actions and activities and ousting people from their homes. It doesn't mean that in the meantime, that if people get forbearance and, and are unable to pay their mortgages, that they, that problem won't come home to roost at some point, it will. You'll be behind on your mortgage and there will have to be a reckoning. Uh, one of the issues with mortgage servicers, it seems to be largely getting cleaned up, is that many of them tried to discourage borrowers uh, from going on forbearance by telling them that you aren't improving your situation at all, you're worsening your situation, and at the end of it, you'll have to pay all of that back at once which is not what's intended under the CFPB's mortgage servicing rules. It's not what's intended by the CARES Act. And for the most part, uh, mortgage servicers that, that have tried to do that have been exposed. And the notion is that they should be working once the moratorium are lifted uh, by allowing people to tack the amount owed onto the end of their mortgage. And, and the grace period will not just have been a temporary situation, but will be extended for the life of the mortgage. And if that's so, and if that's effectively executed by mortgage servicers, then I think the impact will be lessened. But as I said it, in, in my talk, I mentioned that there are uh, something like 3.7 million mortgages in forbearance right now. 1.7 million of those forbearance plans are slated to run out in September. And so things may look very different by January than they do now. Uh, we said all of that. Uh, I don't think we will have the same kind of mortgage or housing crisis this time as we had before because we went into it with sounder mortgages. We went into it with more home equity. Uh, and, and frankly, probably the differential impact in the economy is affecting this too because more people with a mortgage are likely to be people who are able to operate remotely with their jobs. Uh, and it's more renters who are in the face-to-face -face economy. I don't have uh, data quantifying that, but I would be confident that that's likely the case, and therefore um, the differential effects here are being felt a little less on the home ownership uh, market. But we will see again, and we really need to stick close to the data month by month to get a sense of how and, and whether it may be changing, especially as fiscal stimulus if it is not extended. Thank you. Our next question, and let me encourage people, we still have time for a couple more questions if you have them, so you can write them in the Q&A 
function. We have about 15 more minutes. Um, our next question is a, a, a broader future looking question from Professor Katie Young, who says that you end with a call for attention to stability and resilience in the design of the economy. And you note transformative changes that were made since the Great Depression. So what do you think about more extreme proposals, such as a universal basic income, as being perhaps more likely post-COVID, particularly, she writes, given the absence of a blame narrative for the economic contractions? So I think the absence of a blame narrative is important. Last time in the wake of the 2008 crisis, there was room for a lot of finger pointing. And by the way, not much of it was deserved. Uh, but it got to people attacking and defending uh, different elements of the economy in some ways distracted a little bit from the overall uh, macro effects uh, that of, of lessons uh, to take away from that. <clears throat> what I would say uh, about the um, question this time is I do think that the just the unique historical nature of the pandemic, I don't think we've ever seen a worldwide event like this that we, we had worldwide awareness and consciousness of has ever occurred before uh, is such that it is broadening the possibilities for reform and it is opening up uh, new, new fields and new ideas to be actually considered that weren't, were being locked out of our gridlock system before. Uh, certainly the amount of the stimulus and the amount of deficit spending has broken all old you know, frameworks. Uh, and that does mean that issues like a universal basic income or other reforms that might be proposed that might have seemed radical uh, two years ago, uh, you know, won't seem quite so far-fetched and might be tenable uh, depending on uh, where the political landscape falls out uh, in the wake of this upcoming election, which as I said, is uh, unusually consequential uh, in, in our lifetime. Thank you. Actually, let, let me follow up with a question that I had then, since we don't have any others in the Q&A. I wonder if you could talk a little more specifically, sort of gaming out, how, how you think the, the future, let's say the next year, uh, will specifically differ depending upon who wins the election. I mean, this is a, obviously a very speculative enterprise, but I've been struck by Trump's willingness to engage in conversations that historically other Republicans have really wanted to steer away, away from, you know, big, since Eisenhower anyway, big infrastructure spending bills and various things like that. And I wonder how you see the paths diverging depending upon who wins the election. Well, again, that takes different forms. So let's start with what is the effect of the election going to be potentially on the response to the pandemic, which as I said, is at the core of all of this. Uh, if we don't respond effectively to the pandemic, there will be economic fallout. It will be more protracted. It will be more severe. Uh, I think there's, there's really no question that uh, a Biden presidency would be expected to deal more effectively with the pandemic uh, than the Trump presidency has, based in part on the fact that the Trump presidency has had its turn at bat here and dismally failed uh, to, to prevent or mitigate the problem as shown by the fact that deaths in the United States and, and certainly the rate of death and the rate of cases is higher than anywhere in the world. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's just an undeniable comparison unless you're just gonna deny the facts, which is often the response on these types of issues. Whereas uh, what we know about uh, Joe Biden is that he was part of the effort uh, under the Obama administration uh, to deal with the Ebola threat uh, and, and a few others. Uh, different in, in certain respects from the coronavirus threat, but they were effective uh, and took it seriously and worked with the scientists and, and uh, managed to secure real prevention. So if in fact uh, a Biden presidency would mean more effective response on the COVID threat, then that in and of itself means um, almost certainly a better economic path forward. Uh, Beyond that, in terms of, you know, is there more or less likely to be stimulus? Uh, I don't know how much difference there is depending on how the election comes out. Uh, this Congress, it, the Democrats have been very bullish on stimulus, knowing the effects and feeling the effects for individual households around the country and making sure that it's distributed widely. Uh, 
uh, and they've been effective on that with, with the Congress and the CARES Act, which the Senate kind of grudgingly uh, went along with and now is blocking further fiscal relief or certainly uh, uh, minimizing the scope of, of the proposals. Uh, however, the Republicans in the Senate have been willing to countenance budget busting measures that uh, are completely out of step. Uh, you know, the chief of staff to the president is one of the leaders of the Freedom Caucus from the House of Representatives. And they've entirely put aside and swallowed and forgotten about their notions of uh, fiscal austerity that was the big part of their agenda uh, for, um, for the, at least the duration of the Obama uh, presidency and in many ways did hold back uh, some of some of the recovery uh, from, from going faster than it might have. Whether that will continue, <clears throat> whether that will be the same or different if Biden is president as opposed to Trump is president, I don't know. But certainly there has been a lot of stimulus so far. I would guess there will be more, whether it comes before the election or after, regardless of the election, I think there will be more. Uh, and, and again, a lot of that will depend on the response and effectiveness of dealing with the COVID threat itself, which we still haven't got a very good handle on uh, in this country. And that is the, the real source of the, of the misery for most Americans because it leads to both that problem uh, staying with us in a significant degree and it makes the economic circumstances harder and worse for Americans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think maybe we'll end here. Um, I, I just want to thank you again for an absolutely wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. I, as I say, I have some other questions which I want to follow up with you about individually. And, and I, I would encourage all people who are on this, uh, this Zoom webinar to be in touch through the Rapport Center or with you directly through BC or students who are on the call. I know you're uh, being very generous and being uh, available to people to f have follow-up conversations, and I'm sure there will be many more of those in, in the coming weeks and months. And uh, thank you again for a, a very informative presentation. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, everyone. Thank you.